I just can't live with this lie. Just want all this to go away. Our story begins in the small farming community of Lake Crystal, Minnesota. Just before 6 a.m. on August 31st, 2010, Blue Earth County law enforcement received a distressed 911 call. Blue Earth County 911. Oh my gosh, please help us. Please help us. Somebody shot me. What's going on? Somebody shot my husband. Somebody shot your husband? Yeah. Please send the ambulance, please. Okay, is the person still there that shot him? I don't know. He left. Is there anybody else in the house with you? My son is not so Oh my God, my son is so How old is your son? He's just um, 16. 16 year old? Oh my God, I better make sure the woman goes downstairs, wakes her son, and informs him that his stepfather has been shot and that she has been assaulted. The son's voice can be heard in the background. Where in the house are you right now? I'm in the basement right now. Okay, is your son in the basement with you too? Yeah, my son is in my basement too. Are you okay? I'm okay. He got me when I don't know. Not you. He you. No, no, he's got me. Freak out. No, you can't. You can't. You left. On his way to work, a Blue Earth County Sheriff's deputy hears a dispatch call of a home invasion. In hearing the name of those inside the residence in question, he knew exactly where to go because he knew them. The call came from the residence of James and Jennifer Nibby. Upon entering the home, the deputy finds Jennifer and her teenage son Brady sheltering in their basement. Brady had a gun with him that he had grabbed for protection after his mother had woken him up and informed him of what had happened. Jennifer directs the deputy to the bedroom she shares with her husband. On the way to the room, the deputy recalls furniture being out of place and different items lying about. They reach the master bedroom, which is where they find Jennifer's husband, 26-year-old James Nibby, lying in bed with a gunshot wound to the back of his head. He appeared to have been lying on his stomach prior to being shot. The deputy checked for a pulse but was unable to find one. Paramedics arrived shortly after. As additional officers arrive, the scene is secured. Jennifer and Brady are escorted outside of the home. Within 30 minutes, a detective arrives on the scene and speaks with Jennifer. She said that she was getting ready for work. She got up, took a shower, and was in the process of brushing her teeth when she heard a loud bang. She opened the bathroom door to find her husband shot and a masked man holding a shotgun. The intruder attacked her with a knife, placed a rope around her neck, and dragged her to the living room. Jennifer showed the detective the cut marks on the inside of her thighs. She continued by stating that the family dog began barking, to which the intruder reacted by saying, you're lucky, then letting go of her and fleeing. Jennifer said the rope came from their garage, and she recognized the knife as one of their knives. Jennifer then talked about the shotgun the intruder had during the attack. She said that James Nibby, aka Jim, had recently purchased a shotgun as a gift for her, and that they were going to go deer hunting with it the following day. Jennifer said she left the gun outside after a target practice session with her husband the night before. The only two people in the house still alive were Jennifer, Jim's wife, and Jennifer's son, 16-year-old Brady, Jen's son from a previous marriage. You know those annoying promotional mailers you receive from every credit card company known to man? Well, with the sponsor of today's video, Aura, I'm here to tell you that you don't have to get those junk mailers forever. With Aura, your name, address, and phone number are proactively removed from telemarketing and mailing lists. This is just one of the many features Aura has to offer. Aura is the one-stop solution to financial identity and digital security. Aura offers a suite of features, there are too many to name them all, but the ones that stand out to me as the reasons why I use their service are their social security number and personal information monitoring, as well as their credit monitor. With our ever-increasing digital footprint, it's great to have Aura watching your back. Add Aura to your cyber defense arsenal today with a 14-day free trial using the top link in the description or in the pinned comment. If for some reason you don't love the service, you can cancel any time within the 14-day trial period and pay nothing. You have nothing to lose, so start your free trial today at Aura.com slash Crimetastic. This is also a great way to help support the channel. And don't worry, I will remind you about Aura at the end of the video so you can keep on watching. The detective then speaks with Brady. He seemed like he had just woken up. He was confused and in shock. Can you tell me what happened out here today? Well, I was downstairs sleeping and my mom came in at about 6 o'clock or maybe a little earlier. And I slept right through the gunshot, I guess. 
I had a gun downstairs. I have a 22 for hunting and stuff, and so I grabbed that and put some shells in there because I didn't know where he was at or anything like that. So I go upstairs, and she told me to wait down there, but I went upstairs, and I just sat by the, in the entryway, and, we, and then she was crying and stuff, and then we waited till the police got there. The police send Jennifer to the hospital for treatment. Because there was an intruder, police also started a ground search of the area. Corn was planted around the farm near the residence, so they started searching the cornfield on foot. Jim's sister, Leslie Johnson, was notified by her father that a neighbor on Jim Street saw a lot of police cars and tape stretched across the end of Jim's driveway. She called Jim's house and the call went unanswered. Leslie's father asked her to go down there and see what was going on. She said that she immediately felt panicked. She had a feeling that something was terribly wrong. She drove to Jim's house as fast as she possibly could. As she approached the house, she was stopped by an officer. She said to the officer that her little brother lived in that house. The officer looked at her and said, Are you Leslie? She said, Yes. The officer said, I'm sorry, there was a shooting this morning and your brother is dead. She was in absolute shock. She couldn't understand who would have shot her brother and why. Jim's brother Jason was at work at the time. His sister called him and told him the devastating news. He sat in his car for a while, not knowing what to do. Jason said that everybody loved Jim, his big smile, buck teeth, and in a brotherly comment, his stupid grin. Jim's other brother, Dennis Nibby, remembers the good times when Jim would come over, listen to music, and throw darts. Dennis found it odd that somebody would break into Jim's house. He said that Jim didn't owe anybody money, at least that he knew of. The detectives find that the scene was inconsistent with a burglary. None of the items from the home were missing. No forced entry was observed. Detectives now question if Jim was specifically targeted. They needed to find out more about the victim and his relationship with Jennifer and Brady. James Jim Nibby was born on October 30th, 1983. Jim grew up in Vernon Center, Minnesota. He loved to fish and hunt. He enjoyed doing basically anything outdoors. He was a 2002 graduate of Lake Crystal Welcome Memorial High School. In his professional life, Jim was an apprentice electrician. His boss Darren Deluge described Jim as determined and of having a lot of potential. Jennifer Gilman also grew up in rural Minnesota. She was six years older than Jim, born in 1977. Jennifer was a pretty and popular student in high school. When she became pregnant at age 16, Jennifer was determined to be a good mother. In 1993, she gave birth to her son, Brady. She pursued a degree in nursing. She eventually was able to purchase a home and land in rural Blue Earth County, Minnesota. Jennifer's dedication to her son and career didn't leave much time for dating. But in 2007, she met 24-year-old Jim Nibby. He was helping a friend who was having a medical crisis and Jennifer was the nurse responding to that emergency. The two started dating shortly after. In the months that followed, Jim fell in love and decided to propose to Jennifer. He asked for her son's blessing, which he received. Jennifer said yes, and the two were married in May of 2008. Jennifer continued working as a nurse, often working two jobs to make ends meet. Jim was an apprentice electrician, making significantly less than Jennifer. Jennifer's family stated that she was frustrated with being the breadwinner and other aspects of her marriage. Jim was deeply in love with Jennifer and tried to make their marriage work. With their initial interviews of friends and family finished, investigators subpoenaed Jim, Jennifer, and Brady's phone records. Detectives learned that Brady had also called 911. Where is Tony 911? Hi, um, okay. I am, I was sleeping, and my mom came in my room, and she woke me up and said someone broke into our house, and my stepdad got shot. Okay. I don't know if they're still here. Okay, well, we have your mom on the line, and my partner's getting everything that we need to get from him. Okay, thank you. From your mom, so we're going to get people out there as soon as we can for you, okay? Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. In Brady's initial interview, he failed to mention that he had also called 911. This was a conflict in the initial information that detectives were receiving. According to Jim's boss, Darren, Jim liked Brady and wanted to be someone important in Brady's life. Jim had mentioned to Darren some disagreements that he had had with Brady, but it seemed like Jim and Brady got along most of the time. In contrast to Darren's statements, Jim's brother Dennis said that Jim would get frustrated with Brady because he would not complete the chores Jim had asked of him. 
Jim told Dennis that he couldn't get Brady to do anything. He just wanted to stay in his room and play video games. Could these disagreements between stepfather and stepson have led to murder? The detectives speak with Jennifer again. She was asked, who do you think would do this? She believes she recognized the masked intruder by his voice and stature. She reports Paul Hallberg. Paul was Jennifer's previous boyfriend and Jim's best friend. Jennifer believed that Paul was jealous of her and Jim's relationship. Paul would have known the layout of the residence as he previously lived there with Jennifer. As Jim and Jennifer's relationship began, Paul and Jim's friendship ended. This was a clear-cut motive in the eyes of investigators, so they quickly located Paul and brought him in for questioning. I'm guessing, you know, on the phone you kind of mentioned you kind of heard about things that had happened. What do you know about what happened? I guess what I have heard is that, well, initially there was a home invasion and it was a murder. Okay. How did you find out about this, Tucker? Um, the news. Okay. When were you involved uh, in a relationship with Jim? I think it was like a year before they were married. Before she married Jim? Yes. How long was that relationship? Did Two, three years. Did it end well? Not very well, no. Okay, how'd you know Jim? He was just a friend of mine, I guess. Jim was always a good guy and I never had a problem with him. You know, it was, it was always just kind of between me and Jen, I guess. According to Jim's sister Leslie, Jennifer had told her that Paul's family owed her money and that he might be after her. Paul confirmed to detectives that there was some money that was loaned to his father from Jennifer. Tuesday morning. Do you remember where you were at? Not exactly. I know I was, I believe I was at work. Even Jen had mentioned, you know, in her statements, well, you really should go and talk with, uh, with my ex because, you know, I, I think he's somebody that you should really look into. And what, what I'm trying to do with you, too, is if there's a, a surefire way that we can verify where you were at that morning, Mm -hmm. it, it makes life a lot easier for everybody, you know what I mean? Right, yep. Paul reported that he was working in St. James, Minnesota, which is a considerable distance from the Nibby's home. Based on the timeline that he provided to investigators, it is possible that he could have committed the murder. He said that he had made it to St. James at 7.30 a.m. The crime had occurred just prior to 6 a.m. Investigators need to explore Paul's whereabouts further to determine if he is a legitimate suspect. Now, 48 hours after the murder, detectives retrieve phone and computer records from the devices recovered at the scene. In searching through Jennifer's phone, detectives uncover messages she had exchanged with another man. Detectives determine that this male is Greg Nielsen, and that Jen and Greg had dated in the past prior to her dating Jim. There were text messages sent back and forth and some pictures exchanged. The conversation mentioned engaging in a romantic relationship. One of the messages that were sent prior to Jim's death arranged a time for the two to meet up. Detectives wondered if the two were trying to rekindle a long-lost relationship, one that would require Jim to be out of the picture. Was Greg part of the scheme to kill Jim? Four suspects were still on the table for detectives. Jen's son Brady, Jen herself, Jim's former best friend Paul, and Jen's new lover, Greg. Could Jen have instructed one of these men to kill her husband? Detectives made contact with Greg and asked him to come down to the sheriff's office for an interview. They asked where he was in the early morning hours on the day Jim was killed. Greg stated that at the time of the crime, he was at home with his girlfriend and his newborn baby and that he was feeding the child. Detectives asked Greg if his girlfriend knew about the communications he had been having with Jennifer Nibby. He indicated that his girlfriend did not know. They also asked him about the nature of his relationship with Jen. He explained that they had been involved in a romantic relationship many years earlier, but that he had not had any kind of physical relationship with her since then. Jim's sister Leslie stated that Jen was obsessed with any man that would pay attention to her. She reportedly looked for people that she could manipulate. Leslie's suspicions of Jen grew larger as she was provided more information by the police. However, Jim and Leslie's mother saw Jen as part of their family and believed that she wouldn't be capable of harming her son. Detectives get a search warrant for Jen's residence. They find financial documents showing that Jim and Jen were behind on their house payments and credit card bills. Another item found during the search of the home was Jen's personal diary. In reading it, they hear of the family's struggles and her feelings towards this other man, Greg Nielsen. 
She talked about how her husband was a good man, but said she didn't want to be with him anymore, and that she was interested in pursuing a relationship with Greg. Now, three days after Jim Nibby's murder, Jim's boss Darren informs detectives that he has some information that he believes could be important. Darren told investigators about a conversation he had had with Jim about a month prior to his death. Jim had told him that he and Jen were getting a $250,000 life insurance policy, and that it was something that was initiated by Jen, but that he also thought was a good idea. With everything that they had gathered, detectives believe it was time to bring Jen in and make an arrest. On September 10th, 2010, two days after Jim's funeral, Jennifer Lee Nibby was arrested. The following day after being arrested, Jen informed her lawyer and detectives that she wanted to talk. I just want all this to go away. I know. And I know it's not going to. I hope you can look at me in the eyes and believe that I'm not going to lie to you, okay? Um, we don't, we don't want to do that. We don't need to do that. You said yourself, you've always been an honest person. You are of good character, okay? You have no criminal record. You have worked hard to make something of yourself, and you've worked very hard to make something of Brady, and he is a great kid. He's a good kid. He is number one in his class. He is a good kid. Oh, yeah. God, he's a good kid. I just can't live with this lie. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna push you. I know you're having a very hard time with this, okay? This is completely understandable. But we do need to go through the details just one time, okay? Okay. And, and you do it, and we're not going to push, and you do it at your own pace, okay? But I know you want to have the truth out there, exactly the truth, okay? From, from start to finish, one time. Oh, this is horrible. I know. It's horrible, though, you guys. I know. There was a gun. Jim had bought for me. That's true, too. That's very true. Okay. Jim bought the gun for me, wanted me to learn how to target practice. Mm hmm And he had set the gun in the corner. Where at? In which room? In the, um, but next to the sliding glass door. Okay. He set that in the corner, and, and I knew the ammo was up there, too. Okay. And he had showed you how to load the gun? Mm hmm I had taken some pills before I'd gone to bed. Do you remember how many? Probably like six or eight. Which sometimes when I do that, that I, I have a hard time sleeping to begin with because that is how it messes with you sometimes. It kind of like make you agitated? And it does. It kind of keeps you up, um, makes you dream, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I woke up at 5.30 in a panic. And I came back into the bedroom, and there was a throw blanket thing on the end of the bed. So I took that and kind of rested the gun on his shoulder. And I pulled the trigger. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm just so sick of this. This is not me. I am not this person. I called 911 and I went back in to check on it. I couldn't feel a pulse. Jen talked about how she had an addiction to pain pills and how she had been forging her patients' prescriptions. She said that the pills had a big impact on her and that she was not doing well. The pressure of everything, the finances and the drugs and you live your when you 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 live your day for that next fix mm -hmm. she talked about how jim was a good man and that he didn't deserve this my family is never going to work out. neither is his and my son it was horrible It was horrible what did happen. They thought, oh my god, what did I do? What did I do? Mm -hmm. And that's why I made it look like someone tried to hurt me and okay. came in. And okay. I, I, I want to make sure on a couple things, though, that are important, okay? 
Brady had nothing to do with any of this. No. Swear. Brady, I swear to God. No, I swear to and God. He doesn't know no. anything about it. He didn't help you set no. the scene up no. or anything. Oh you truly, God, no. you truly didn't wake him up until no. Afterwards. I swear to God. Okay. I swear. I swear on my life. I swear. Well, I know. I I believe you if you swear that it's the truth. But I, I do. But I have to ask you yes. that. I have to be clear on that. I do. Um, Brady but, had absolutely nothing to do with it. He was so startled. Mm-hmm. When I went down there, because I was on the phone with 911, mm-hmm. when I went down there to ask him, he he was he was asleep. You know, okay. he was dead asleep, and I called his name twice, and then he finally woke up. And that ex-boyfriend, you two never actually slept together. No. It was all just texting, so it was yes. just flirting. Absolutely. Or there was never anything physical. Absolutely not. Okay. Nothing physical ever. Okay. No. Okay. So he and he knew nothing of any of this. No, absolutely I mean, not. Oh no, no. Didn't say get rid of your husband. No, 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 no. <laughs> nothing like that. So no. he's not involved in this in any way. No, he's not. No, okay. he's not. Okay. No. Is it okay if I ask you? Because I was wondering too, and you know, because we had talked that morning and stuff, and then I went in there and you were on the couch sitting there with Brady. There was stuff laying there in the room, and there was a chair that was moved and stuff. Mm-hmm. When did all that stuff get put in the room or changed or? Because our assumption was that it, you know, you kind of set that set that stuff up. Do you remember though what was put out there and the, and moved around and stuff? I know I had pushed the chair. I had disheveled the, sh- the chair, the newsstand next to it. Okay. And um, the rope and the knife. Okay. And where did the rope come from? It was on the counter. Okay. And the knife is a kitchen knife. Yeah. And so you brought that in there yes. and just laid it down. Yes. Okay. That would have been before you called 911, though. Yes. And just the last couple things, so the cuts on your legs, yeah. you inflicted? Yes. The marks on your neck? Yes, you inflicted. Right, you didn't help you inflict any no. of those things or do any of that? No. I know you said he's not involved, but I'm just no. making sure. You used the knife to make the marks on your neck? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And same thing with your arms? Yeah. And the knife that you put out there or a different knife? No, the same knife. That same knife, yeah. okay. If I have an opportunity to speak with, with, um, with Jim's family, would you like me to relay that message to them, that you're sorry? I do. Okay, I, I will do that. It won't help, but... That may or may not be. It may, you, you may be right, but I, if you want me to relay that message to them, I will. That would be nice. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yep. The investigation, along with Jennifer's statements, concluded that she had acted alone and that none of the other associates, family members, friends, or anyone else was involved in this crime. Leslie assumed that Jen was cheating on her brother, but she said that she never thought in a million years that Jen would put the barrel of a shotgun on his shoulder and pull the trigger. On March 30th, 2011, Jennifer Nibby was indicted for first-degree murder. During the trial, she claimed to have no memory of what had happened on the day of her husband's death. Jen also said that she had suffered abuse at the hands of Jim Nibby. Sitting with her hands folded over a Bible in court, Jennifer Lee Nibby dabbed tears from her eyes saying, quote, I understand the Nibby family cannot ever forgive me. There is no such thing as justice in a case like this. In the courtroom today, multiple victim impact statements were read. After Nibby's attorney spoke in defense, an outburst ensued. After today's hearing, James's sister, Leslie Nibby Johnson, spoke to the press. Jen's lack of remorse and her inability to look my family in the face and simply say, I'm sorry for killing your son, your brother, your uncle, is disgusting. On July 9th, 2012, Jennifer Nibby takes a plea deal and is sentenced to 25 years. Jim's brother Dennis said that they didn't get justice. They got an agreement between lawyers. He states that he is frustrated and that this case has forever changed him. Darren, Jim's boss, said that Jim was only 200 hours from being able to test out for his journeyman's license. Darren said that it was really sad to know how close Jim had gotten to his goal, knowing that his life was cut short. Jason said that it was tough to keep on living his life without Jim. He said that there are old memories, but no new ones. Leslie said that Jen had taken away Jim's dreams of having a big family and being a successful electrician that wanted to have his own business one day. Remember to check out Aura with the link in the description or in the pinned comment. For more videos of cases never before seen on YouTube, click one of the videos on screen now or the links in the pinned comment.
goodbye for now.